Okay, here we go. Stand by. Three, two, one, action. Assume nothing. Rash, bald face, blasphemy. Question everything. I find it extremely hard to imagine. Open your eyes. It is quite all right to be an atheist. The fastest growing group of people in the country has been measured as being those who have no belief or who are atheists. You don't have to be apologetic or quiet about it. Challenge the opposition. You see religion on a hundred fronts losing the argument. And start thinking. This is The Thinking Atheist Worldwide. Our show today is brought to you by Harry's.com. Amazing shaving sets, awesome gifts for friends and family, and until December the 18th, you get economy shipping for the holidays and five bucks off your first order if you use the code THINKINGATHEIST. Go to Harry's.com, H-A-R-R-Y-S.com. So I'm standing in line at Best Buy a couple days ago. I'm at the customer service desk. I have to make an exchange. A computer cable I had was wrong. I had to switch it out. And I'm standing in line. I'm third in line, okay? I'm just waiting. And the store is not too unbelievably crazy for the month of December. Everybody seems to be in a good place. We're just hanging out there. And all of a sudden, this couple walks up. Man and woman in their 50s, I'm guessing husband and wife, both of them have their arms filled with merchandise. Now, I don't know what their story is. I don't know what the history is between them and Best Buy. I have no idea what the nature of their transaction was. I can only document for you what happened, okay? So there were two lines. There's the merchandise line, which is the one I was in, and then there's the customer service line. And there was no cashier in the customer service line. It was just dead. The lane was open, but nobody was over there. So there's three people on my side, nobody on the customer service line. And apparently to this couple, it seemed like a great opportunity to just go right up, to just skip forward and get helped next. So they walk right up to the register. And they wait less than a minute. The transaction in front of me finishes, and the lady at the register doesn't call the couple she gets the next person in my line. And these two freak. The woman takes all the merchandise in her hands and just smashes it onto the floor. Just throws it down. And the husband does the same thing. So now there's this big pile of stuff on the ground. And they're wailing and carrying on. And their arms are flailing in the air. And they just stomp out toward the exit. The manager, or somebody in a blue shirt, is pawing at them, following them, trying trying to get them to calm down. Hey, hang on just a second. What's the problem here? Let's see if we can sort this out. They weren't interested. They kept shouting and shouting and flailing and whatnot all the way through the glass doors and all the way into the parking lot and home to wherever. As the customers and the employees all just look at each other, like, who are these people? What just happened? Now, I don't know the details of their story, but I do know how people can be this time of year. The time of year when love and hope and peace and yuletide go right out the window and it becomes getting your meat hooks on the next material possession. I know what that's like. We see it all the time. And these two were classic cases of it. And as they wailed and stomped all the way out to the parking lot, I did have the thought in my mind. I really did. You know what? These two would deserve a visit from the Krampus. Santa's Christmas Demon, which of course is a topic of many conversations now that the film has released here in the United States. The Krampus legend, not well known here in the U.S. until just recently, and the film has sort of helped with that. I went to the movie with high hopes and hated it. A lot of people went and had a great time and good for them. I was hugely disappointed. I just thought it was loud and irritating. It's supposed to be funny. It's supposed to be scary. It wasn't funny in my mind. It wasn't funny or scary. A wasted opportunity. Now, I'm not trying to be a snob here, okay? But I wrote about the Krampus in my book, Sacred Cows. Did a chapter called Santa's Little Helper, where we talk about the Krampus legend, how it's celebrated all around the world. And then I capped the chapter with my own dark twist on Clement Moore's Twas the Night Before Christmas. Well, in the broadcast today, I'm going to go ahead and share some of that for you as we explore the Krampus and other Christmas traditions. And I will read for you my version of Twas the Night Before Christmas 
in the audible.com version, in the audiobook, I produced it all up with music and sound effects. Not going to do that for this show. If you want the full enchilada, you can get the audiobook, but I will read it for you tonight. And we're going to take some time and just explore strange and unusual and interesting and fascinating Christmas traditions that aren't Santa and the Reindeer and Frosty the Snowman and tinsel and ornaments on the Christmas tree and Christmas turkey and gift exchange and all that stuff. Tonight, we're going to explore many unusual, strange, bizarre, and occasionally alarming Christmas traditions that are practiced across the planet. And the first one I'm going to share with you is a doozy. And it has to do with a nativity figure that pulls his pants down and takes a dump in your nativity scene. I, if you'll pardon the expression, shit you not. That's coming up here in just a second. But first, uh, I want to give kudos to the folks at Harry's for the holiday set. It's a shaving set. It comes with this copper-plated razor handle, a couple of five-blade cartridges, shaving cream, and an included travel kit. It's all boxed up really nicely. Everything fits so well together, and it's packaged in a way that you can essentially give it as a Christmas gift without even bothering to wrap it. It looks that good. Harrys.com is providing the no-brainer gift idea for your dad, your husband, your brother, your coworker, whoever. And I'm not only a seriously huge fan of Harry's and glad they're on the show because their stuff does. It looks great. It shaves great. I'm a huge fan of eliminating the retail markups and just making a customizable premium shave experience available directly to you and me. I love the fact that Harry's gives a percentage of sales revenue and employee time back into the communities they serve. Really slick holiday shaving sets start at 15 bucks, And if you type in the code thinking atheist, you get $5 off your first first purchase. For a primary gift or a stocking stuffer, it's perfect for you. With economy shipping right to your door until December the 18th. Give, shave, and save right now at harrys.com. H-A-R-R-Y-S dot com. Let us travel, my friends, to Catalonia, Spain. Their nativity scenes in Catalonia feature a figure that is not the baby Jesus. It's not Joseph, it's not Mary, it's not the wise men, it's not the animals. These scenes feature El Cagane. El Cagane literally translates the crapper. El Cagane is a pleasant-looking man who wears a red cap. He is squatting, his pants are pulled down, his ass exposed, and he is defecating. So why do these nativity scenes feature a guy who has taken a dump? Well, the origin of this particular tradition is unknown. It's been around since the 18th century, a few hundred years. Apparently, it's pretty popular. And the icon has become popular throughout parts of southwestern Europe. In fact, if you go to the Cathedral of Cuidad Rodrigo, province of Salamanca, hidden inside the cathedral itself is the sculpture of a person who is evacuating his bowels. <laughs> I'm sorry. What? In the standard nativity scenes, El Cagane is not a centerpiece of the display. He's not doing his business right there next to the baby Jesus. Right? He's not in the center of attention. He's usually tucked away. They put him in the periphery, near the corner of the scene, far away from the manger. Some people hide him inside their nativities, and it becomes a game to try to find him. But why, why is he playing with Mr. Hanky? Why is he baking brownies, parking the custard, going number two, why, at the nativity scene? Well, some explanations include this, that he's fertilizing the ground for future nativity scenes, some say it brings luck. Some say it's a lampooning of powerful people. It shows those in the halls of power, celebrities and whatnot, showing them with their pants down, bringing them down to earth with the rest of us. Some theorize that he represents the mischievous spoil sport, you know, the one lurking inside of us, our inner child, the person who's not afraid to get in touch with their inner adolescent at family celebrations. Now, in 2005, the Barcelona City Council provoked outrage and public outcry 
when it commissioned a nativity scene that didn't include El Cagané. They felt it was inappropriate, especially since, you know, for the rest of us, public defecation is against the law. And the icon just set a bad example. Let's skip it this year. That was allegedly the rationale. Well, people everywhere got their pulled down underwear in a twist over this thing. And the nativity restored it the following year. And this is not, by the way, the only poop-related Christmas tradition in Spain. Perhaps you've heard of the annual shit log. It's an actual log that's hollowed out, and they give it stick legs, and then they create a smiley face on one end of the log, and then they give it a big red hat, and they fill the cavity of the log with candy and sweets. And on December 8th of every single year, the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, families will bring out the log, the Christmas log, the Tio de Nadal. Every night from the 8th through Christmas Eve, children are charged to take care of this thing. They, quote unquote, feed the log by offering him nuts and dried fruit and water. They also have to cover it with a blanket to make sure it stays nice and warm and comfortable. And then Christmas Eve, kids gather around this log and they beat it with sticks while singing a song. A song, I guess, that's called Shit Log. (laughs) I'm not going to sing it for you. I'm not going to recite it for you, but I will play an excerpt for you. Okay, so they've taken the log that they had previously cared for and kept warm and fed and nurtured, and uh, then they beat it with sticks so that it might produce something special. Then comes the Christmas miracle. The kids look under his blanket and discover that this log has pooped out, quote unquote, pooped out a pile of candies and presents from inside the cavity. And whenever they're done beating him and getting all their candy, then they burn the log in the fireplace for warmth. And in case you're curious, there's photos of all this stuff online. You can just Google it and see, okay? Let's get an unusual holiday tradition from our listeners. We'll start with area code 972. You're on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. Who's this? Uh, My name's Chris. Chris, we're talking about unusual Christmas traditions. What do you have for the show today? Well, I actually only started celebrating our traditions last year. Why last year? Why the change? Because um, up until then, I was totally content with celebrating Christmas with a family. And um, some things happened, ideas changed, and uh, I feel like I want to be totally secular about it, you know? I don't know. Maybe I should tell a bit of a story first yeah, to explain ahead. that. Go ahead. All right. Um, it was about two years ago. It was just a couple of days before Christmas, and, uh, you know, I was at home celebrating with family. And my dad took me and my niece out to dinner somewhere. And my niece is sitting there across the table. My dad just out of nowhere starts preaching to her that she doesn't need science because she has Jesus. And I was pretty thoroughly offended by it. And on some level, I thought, you know, maybe that was a jab at me because I was pretty open about my atheism at that point, but I never really outright said it to my father. And uh, I talked to him afterwards and I asked him about it, didn't say anything at the table. And he said, yeah, it, it was totally something he said because he had suspicions that I was leaning towards that brand of thinking. So this was his passive aggressive way at trying to communicate to you. Oh yeah. Well, it's interesting to me though, that he didn't take it to you directly. I mean, just sit down and have a conversation over coffee or something. And, and you know, that, that was weird to me. That's why I confronted him about it later. And when he said that much, I just told him, well, you should have just asked me, I would have told you I'm an atheist. And it, it was a pretty, disappointing thing for him to hear. You could tell, you know, he had a pretty poor reaction to it. He got really quiet and he tried to start a conversation a couple of times, couldn't quite do it. And then he offered me a couple of books and uh, (laughs) I agreed. Man, have we been there? Here, read this book. This will change your mind. Yeah. And and he gave me the books. I I said I would take them home and read them. And it was the most condescending crap. But um, (laughs) 
Anyway, it was Christmas Eve. He gathered everybody around for just a Christmas prayer, which is something he never did before. And uh, right before he had his prayer, he did a little mini sermon. My dad was a Sunday school teacher, so he's really good at this. And the sermon that he came up with was about an atheist farmer who was trying to save a flock of geese from an impending storm or something like that. And he was just trying to corral them into his barn and, you know, Every time he tried to do this, they would just scatter and run away from him. And um, the farmer had this sort of revelation, you know, like, I'm trying to save these geese, but they don't understand and they don't know me, so they won't let me save them. And then all of a sudden, this atheist farmer was a Christian. Oh, that man, that just, that just pissed me off. And, I can um, kind of see the look on your face, Chris. <laughs> just this quizzical, you got to be shitting me moment on your Christmas holiday. Um, yeah. I guess that was just building for a couple of years prior, and I didn't even realize. And um, at, at that point, I, I wasn't just an out-of-the-closet atheist. I, I was very adamantly opposed to organized religion and indoctrination, and I really wanted to get away from a religious holiday, but I still wanted to keep the holiday, you know? It's good times. <laughs> Well, that but, brings us back to the original theme of the show. We're talking about unusual Christmas traditions. You've embraced something else yeah. for you and yours? Oh, yeah. Well, we started with, hey, let's do Festivus, because, you know, people are kind of familiar with that, Seinfeld or whatever. I never watched the show, but I heard about it. And so we, we kind of did that. We got a Festivus poll. We even went so far as to get a clock and put it in a sack and nail it to uh, the wall somewhere, because we heard that was actually what the writer's family did, the writer of the show. I hate to interrupt, but real fast, for those who don't know what Festivus is, they don't have a context, allow me to go to the FestivusWeb.com website and just give you the quick rundown, okay? Happy Festivus is the traditional greeting of Festivus, a holiday featured in Seinfeld on an episode that aired December 18, 1997. According to the Seinfeld models, Festivus is celebrated every year on December 23rd. The slogan of Festivus is, a Festivus for the rest of us. The usual holiday tradition of a tree is manifested in an unadorned aluminum pole, which is in direct contrast to normal holiday materialism. Those attending Festivus may also participate in the airing of grievances, which is an opportunity to tell others how they've disappointed you in the past year, followed by a Festivus dinner and then completed by the feats of strength, where the head of the household must be pinned. Thanks for letting me digress there. I just wanted to sort of describe Festivus for the audience. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, that pretty much nails it. That's um, the sort of foundation we started with. And we added a few things that were really just for us. We like the imaginary deities that people have made up, the cosmic teapot, the invisible pink unicorn, the flying spaghetti monster. Everybody's familiar with this. So we came up with sort of traditions to represent each of those things. And so now we try to use very absurd methods of launching a teapot into space for really no reason except to, you know, shatter the teapot. We just want to break something. <laughs> All right, hang on. But, um, hang on. We're talking about Russell's teapot, the celestial teapot. You actually throw them in the air or you create devices that launch them into the sky? What are we talking about? Well, last year it was a small catapult. Um <laughs> Yeah. No, I like it. I like it. You guys created like a trebuchet or something or what? Well, not quite a trebuchet, but it was really close. We came up with a design for a, just a very simple catapult, surgical tubing, uh, you know, a two by four, you know, a couple other materials to put it all together. Very simple, very cheap. And we just launched a thing about 20 feet in the air, something like that. It comes down, it shatters. Oh, man, we'll try next year. <laughs> it's like the Christmas version of Pumpkin Chunkin'. I love the idea. Kind of, yeah. You like your okay. Christmas with a little bit of irreverence and uh, yeah. without a serious adherence to some mythology. You guys like to have some fun with it. Do you do the Festivus pole, the aluminum pole in the house with nothing on it or what? Actually, ours is made of pine. We just decided to go with an all wood Festivus pole. No branches, no ornaments, no tree topper, no nothing? No, nothing like that. Just a stick. Just a pole. Right. I didn't even stain it. <laughs> okay. Do you have a teapot launch scheduled for Christmas 2015? Oh, yeah. Yeah. We're thinking um, 
maybe just tie it to a couple of model rockets, or we might use a potato gun, you know, potato cannon. It's going to be one of those. I love it. And it's a great and unusual Christmas tradition. And thanks for sharing your traditions on the radio and hope the holidays are great for you and yours. Okay, Chris? Okay, sure. Sounds good. Most of us are familiar with, and perhaps even attended at some point, Christmas church services, right? But I'd wager that you never attended Christmas Eve or Christmas Day church service quite like this. In Venezuela's capital of Caracas, it's customary to get up really early on Christmas Day and travel to a very early Christmas church service. And you get there on roller skates. And this is serious stuff. They even block off the streets so cars can't get into the area, making it safer for Christmas skaters. And apparently, they're way serious about Christmas church. Way serious. Their Christmas services kick off December the 16th, and they do Mass every morning through Christmas Eve. They even set off fireworks and ring bells well before the sun comes up, you know, just to make sure that your ass is awake and out of bed, and you're getting ready for church that morning. Oh, that would just piss you off, I think. The Telegraph reported about this Christmas tradition. It takes place in Portugal. During the traditional Christmas feast, you set extra places at your dining table, and those places are reserved for your deceased relatives. So if Grandma passed away a few years ago... She still gets her place, her place at the table, her plate, her silverware, her cup, her napkin, the whole shooting match. This is said to bring good fortune. In Finland, Christmas time honors the dearly departed in an interesting and quite beautiful way, I think. Families will travel to the grave sites of their loved ones every Christmas and they light candles all around the scene. And so many people participate in this particular Christmas tradition But the candles illuminate the cemeteries and graveyards, just bathing them in gold light and bringing a warm glow to the memories of those they lost. Did you know this? Did you know that the Japanese apparently avoid the color red on their Christmas cards and I think even their Christmas decorations? I mean, red's the color of Christmas, is it not? Red and green? Not in Japan. In Japan, the color red is associated with death. In fact, you normally send a red greeting card to somebody who is bereaved, somebody who's lost somebody, somebody who is in mourning for the loss of a loved one. In Japan, their Santa Claus is a little bit different than what we're used to here in the United States. He's got eyes in the back of his head. Those extra eyes are so he can keep an eye on naughty children. Now, one more thing about Christmas in Japan you might find interesting. Did you know that a ton of Japanese people have their Christmas Eve feasts at KFC? Kentucky Fried Chicken. I'm not lying. It all began with a hugely successful KFC marketing campaign back in 1974. Kentucky for Christmas was what it was called. And the short version is this. You can't find turkey in Japan. You just can't get it. So KFC is like, hmm, what's another bird people might be interested in on the holidays? And they put together this marketing campaign called Kentucky for Christmas. Have chicken at KFC on Christmas time. And this began a firestorm of Christmas chicken consumption. According to an article in the Smithsonian Magazine, one theory about its appeal is this. There's this tendency of the Japanese to kind of latch on to foreign products and ideas, and then they'll kind of make them their own. And the particular, quote, American-ness of Kentucky Fried Chicken holds a lot of appeal to the Japanese. So chicken has become their Christmas turkey. In fact, the restaurants are so packed every Christmas, if you want to do KFC for the holidays, you have to call and make advance reservations. And many orders are placed months in advance of December. It's that popular. No kidding. Area code 909, you're on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. Who's this? This is Lisa. Lisa, Merry Christmas in advance. Do you say Merry Christmas in your house? Yes, we do. And you probably have the standard traditions, right? The tree and the turkey and all that stuff, or what? Of course. 
If we're talking today, you probably have a tradition that is not quite so common. What would that be? Well, my son had um, Darth Vader as a pinata at his uh, sixth birthday party, and my husband decided that it would be a good idea to use that as a tree topper. So for the last four years, we've had the head of Darth Vader as a tree topper for That's a tree. Beautiful. That's beautiful. So you guys have got to be totally amped about the Star Wars movie that's releasing in just a few days. Very much so. My husband is a huge Star Wars fan, and so is my son. They've got a lot of the Star Wars Lego sets, and um, even my sister-in-law will still send my husband some Star Wars things for his birthdays. Oh, you know, sometimes I think about all the Star Wars stuff I had as a kid. And this was late 70s, early 80s, right? The first run, you know, the first release, the original toys back from the original Star Wars. And I think, you know, if I'd have kept this stuff sealed in its package, some of this stuff is worth a ton of money these days. Oh, yeah, very much so. Back to the tree topper, though. Does it dominate the tree or is it kind of small? Well, it's and it a just... long, sort of skinny tree. So it does look a little top heavy. Um, it's probably about the size of a standard human head with a helmet on it. <laughs> um, so it's about that size. And this year we also stuck a lightsaber through the middle of the tree and put some droid ornaments on it as well. But in the past, it's just been the Darth Vader head. If you get a chance, you know, if you don't mind, send me a photograph of the tree and I might sure. repost it on my uh, Seth Andrews Facebook page and let everybody kind of see what you guys did for Christmas. Okay. Sounds good. All right, we'll have a wonderful holiday, and I'll see you at the theaters here in a few days, okay? Okay, thanks. Norwegians do something weird around Christmas every single year. Many in Norway believe Christmas Eve is a time of great spiritual activity, and not all of it is good. Christmas Eve coincides with the arrival of darker spirits, evil spirits, witches... So before the family calls it a day on Christmas Eve and goes to sleep, they hide all the brooms in the house. Brooms, you know, brooms that witches might find and then go for a joyride on. You got to hide those on Christmas Eve. Now, witches bring good tidings if you are in Italy. Instead of waiting on Santa Claus every single Christmas, children await the arrival of, and I hope I'm saying this right, Befana, B-E-F-A-N-A. Befana, the friendly witch who brings candy and sweets. She doesn't bring them on December 25th. She brings them after the New Year on the 5th of January. And she's a lot like Santa. You know, if you've been a disobedient child, you're not going to get candy in your stocking. She will give you a lump of coal or leave a twig in the stocking instead. Some say she's a meticulous housekeeper. And she uses her witch's broom to actually sweep your house for you while you sleep, symbolically sweeping away the problems of the past year and creating a fresh start for the new one. Instead of leaving milk and cookies out for Bifana, Italian families typically leave out a small plate of finger foods and, of course, a glass of wine. Do you hide the pickle on Christmas? This is alleged to be a serious, legitimate holiday tradition. So if you automatically defaulted to something naughty when you heard hide the pickle, that's on you. You know, that's on you. This is a real thing. The legend, the origin of it, highly disputed. But it's out there and a lot of people hide the pickle on Christmas. Here's how it works. You have a pickle ornament. In your Christmas tree decorations, just like you would hang the Christmas bulbs and the tinsel and the lights and all that, there's a pickle. And you place the pickle discreetly on the tree somewhere in a subtle place that's not easily seen. And then when the kids get up on Christmas morning, it becomes a game to find the pickle. Who's the first who will find the pickle ornament? The first one to locate it gets a reward or they get good luck for the following year. A whole lot of people say that this tradition originated in Germany. But that is not the case. It looks like the Christmas pickle actually started in America sometime in the 19th century. A whole lot of different origin stories on this one. And honestly, none of them are interesting at all. What is interesting is this. Berrien Springs, Michigan, a place known for the production of cucumbers, was once known as the Christmas Pickle 
capital of the world. And they had a parade, a pickle parade. From 1992 to 2003, they did this. No doubt a festival filled with laughter, delicious food, Christmassy cheer, and of course a ton of double entendres. Now this next tradition is of German origin. It starts on the 5th of December, when kids are supposed to leave a boot or a shoe outside their bedroom doors. It's kind of a naughty or nice scenario. The children who've been good will get a tree branch that's covered in candy. If they have not been good, they get the branch, but it's bare and no sweets for them. Some German communities also have an icon in their Christmas celebrations called Christ Kindle or the Christ Child, who is not Jesus. It's a girl. It's a fair-haired girl who wears a crown that's made of candles, and she goes house to house carrying a basket of small presents. What would you do if you saw a spider web on your Christmas tree? You might be fascinated. You might freak. But in the Ukraine, spider webs belong on the Christmas tree. Not real spider webs. Artificial spider webs. Decorative spider webs. The custom apparently ties to an old legend about a poor woman who had a Christmas tree. She didn't buy the tree. It had grown from a pine nut that fell upon her earthen floor, and it took root and then grew right there inside her house. So the woman then had a Christmas tree, but not enough money to actually decorate the thing. And her heart was filled with sadness because she couldn't properly decorate the tree for her and her children. So they all went to sleep on Christmas Eve. And when they awoke Christmas morning, they discovered that throughout the night, a spider had covered the tree in a sparkling web that adorned the branches and sparkled silver and gold in the sunlight. An unexpected, organic, miraculous decoration for Christmas and a beautiful Christmas surprise. Poor only in the sense of their pockets, they had been showered with the silver and gold that truly meant something, the kind that filled their hearts, and according to the legend, they never felt poor. Again, now a whole lot of versions of this story are out there. Some don't have the sunlight hitting the web. Some end with a kind of Christmas miracle that involved Jesus or Father Christmas. A few versions of the story actually tell the tale from the perspective of the spiders themselves. Well, in that tradition, Ukrainians often decorate their Christmas trees with spider ornaments and fake spider webs. By the way, it's also speculated that these fake webs may explain the origin of using tinsel on the Christmas tree as decoration every single year. Now, if you are in Greenland, and let's say you're salivating in anticipation of the Christmas feast, Christmas dinner of turkey and sweet potatoes and all that stuff, you might be in for a bit of a surprise. An annual Christmas delicacy in Greenland, apparently, is matic... Am I saying it right? M-A-T-T-A-C-K. It's raw whale skin that has some blubber still attached to it. Now, if that is not up there on your list with pumpkin pie and smoked ham and whatever, perhaps another Greenland favorite holiday food called kiviak. Am I saying it right? K-I-V-I-A-K, kiviak. To make this, you take an auk, which is a small Arctic bird, and you wrap the auk in seal skin. So you got a bird wrapped in seal skin, okay? Then you take it and you bury it for several months. After a few months have passed, you go, you dig the whole thing up, and then you eat the decomposed flesh during the Christmas holidays. In my mind, honestly, this just sounds like a great way to keep the relatives from bothering you on the holidays. Oh my God, they're going to serve Kiviak again this year. I'm not going. We're going to go do something else. That's what it sounds like. Area code 317. You're on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. Who's this? Hi, this is Liz. Liz, we're getting ready for Christmas. We're talking unusual traditions or customs. What do you have today? Well, my family has a pretty unique tradition where we exchange an ugly doll every year at Christmas, and then the lucky person to get her has to keep her prominently displayed in their house for an entire year. Is it a specific doll, or do you pick a new ugly doll every single year? It is a specific doll. We call her Midnight Madness. Uh, That was the name of the sale that my aunt found her in. 
She's a little plastic figure, about five, six inches tall. She fits in your hand. She uh, is wearing a skin-tight, glittery dress, and uh, she's got all long white gloves, all sorts of things like that. Her hair and makeup is styled kind of in the 1940s, 1950s fashion. We have a pedestal that we put her on a few years ago, and now the pedestal travels from house to house with her. And uh, it's a flower vase that my cousin made in college. The, the thing weighs probably six, seven pounds. And uh, when she made the vase, she forgot to include an opening. So uh, it wound up being purely decorative, not functional at all. And uh, one year we decided that that was the perfect thing for our doll to sit atop. Tell me again, how is it determined who gets the doll every year? Every Thanksgiving we get together and we put all of our names into a bowl. And uh, whoever currently holds the doll will draw the name and they have to keep it to themselves until Christmas where the night is presented to the new lucky winner. The person who has the doll draws the names for the next year? Is that how it works? Yes. I see. Mm -hmm. So if you've drawn midnight, it's already sort of been determined, but there's no way of knowing until December 25th. Absolutely. All right. We shall wait in suspense. Thanks for sharing your tradition and have a Merry Christmas, okay? Thank you. I've got Elliot on Skype. Elliot, you're on the Thinking Atheist Radio podcast. How are you? Seth, hi. I'm very well, and I'm delighted to speak to you. I think you're doing a fantastic job out there. Just a, such a shame that you're needed. Well, thank you. Thanks for listening. Where are you calling from? I'm calling from Chichester, which is uh, in the southernmost bit of England. We're talking about unusual Christmas traditions on the radio. Do you have something for the show tonight? Well, I, I do. I, I, we have a very unusual tradition in my family, and it's something that maybe your listeners can help with because we're, we're running out of ideas after about 25 years. I'll tell you the story. It all started when my wife drew a picture on a Christmas card and the kids and I were completely baffled by this picture. Now, she alleges that it was supposed to be lips puckered into a kiss. But the kids and I saw it as a rat that had been run over and killed. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and for some reason, this stuck. And not just Christmas, but birthdays as well. Every greetings card that we've ever given one another since, we've all drawn a roadkill. We've turned it into a challenge because you're not allowed to repeat. You've got, you have to come up with an original idea every time you do this. And after 25 years, this is getting harder and harder. Um, I mean, you know, we've we've had all manner of, you know, pheasants being run over and hedgehogs being run over and dogs being run over and people being run over. But after a while, you, you, you need to find something new. I mean, we've been reduced to lawnmowers being run over by bigger lawnmowers. What else have we had? Um, a tractor being run over by a tank. And recently we had a giraffe run over by a stampeding herd of elephants. Is this something you guys talk about? Every year, you're like, oh, I can't wait till we do this because it's going to be so funny, that kind of thing? Mm, no. It no, just happens. You just, just do it organically. Just, I think we just have forgotten about it and so that, we're, so that we're pleasantly surprised when we open a card and, oh, look. <laughs> All right. <laughs> they remembered. Well, we'll put our listeners on this, you know, some roadkill illustration options for your Christmas yeah. Holiday tradition, my friend. Yeah, that would be helpful. I could, if I if I can if I can come up with something more creative than the kids, that would that would definitely be a good thing. I love it. Well, I hope your Christmas is fantastic, and thanks for sharing your tradition. Okay. Thank you. Merry Christmas to you, Seth, and to your listeners. Our next unusual tradition takes us to South Wales, to something called the Mari Lloyd. Now, I think this one's a little creepy. It's got a touch of Halloween in it. Okay. And it's a custom where you go door to door with a group of guys, usually four to seven men. And you have with you this apparatus. It's a horse's skull, quite often a real skull. And it's mounted on a pole and it makes some kind of a hobby horse, right? It's, it's a fake horse. It's got a sheet wrapped over the pole and you transport it with you as part of your troop. I don't know if you act like you're riding the thing or not. All right. And sometimes you can rig the horse jaw with a spring and a rope and a lever and all these things so you can make the mouth open and close as if the horse is actually alive. And this group of guys parades from house to house with the horse. 
Each guy is wearing colored ribbons and he's carrying different items. They're decorated, so to speak. And this troop would approach your house and then ask to come in. Might we come in for food and ale? And you say no and you make up an excuse and they sing a song. And then after the song is over, they ask to come in again. You make more excuses why they cannot enter your home. Thank you very much for coming, but we can't let you in or we're busy or we're doing other things. Whatever. You have to make excuses up. Now, whoever gives up first wins. If the horse group gives up first, they simply go on to the next house. If you as the homeowner give up or run out of excuses or whatever, you have to let these guys inside your house and you provide for them holiday food and ale. Now, the origins and practices of this are all over the place. Most people believe the Mari Lloyd stands for Grey Mayor, an icon that's perhaps associated with none other than the Virgin Mary herself. How do you get from Virgin Mary to a dead horse? I don't know. Some people say it stems back to the ancient festival of Samhain. And of course, that holiday also speaks to Halloween. I don't know. You know, would you let a group of up to seven singing men carrying a horse skull on a stick into your house for drinks? Even on Christmas, would you do that? This Christmas season, celebrate as you wish, but beware. Beware the Yule Cat. This is a piece of folklore out of Iceland. And it revolves around a huge, vicious, monstrous cat. The Yule Cat. A cat that lurks about the countryside every single Christmas season. It's lurking, it's watching, it's waiting. Waiting to discover someone who hasn't received any new clothes to wear before Christmas Eve. And it finds those people and it pounces upon them and eats them. Apparently, the legend of the Yule Cat was once used as kind of a kick in the ass to local farmers and their workers to get them going, to get them working harder, to process the autumn wool before Christmas. You see, workers who got their quotas done, they received new clothes. Those who were slackers, those who didn't make the deadline, they didn't get new clothes. And as such, they were as good as cat food. It's like they were marked as prey for the Yule Cat, the man-eating beast who would make them its Christmas feast. And so they would tell them, if you don't get your work done, you're not going to get new clothes, and the Yule Cat will dine upon your bones. Merry Christmas! <laughs> now, I don't know, Yule Cat just sounds like an SUV to me, you know? The Yule Cat by Nissan. That's what it sounds like. It's a badass name for some kind of vehicle. Christmas is a key time for many people out there who may be wanting to get married. In the Czech Republic, there's an annual ritual for wannabe brides or maybe not wannabe brides. Here's how this one works. Women turn their backs to the front door of their houses and they toss a shoe backwards over their shoulder. You know, like one might toss the bouquet. Once the shoe is thrown... The woman turns around and then she looks and sees how the shoe fell. What direction is it facing? If the heel is toward the door, she's going to stay single. No proposal for her that year. If the toe of the shoe points toward the door, it's a sign she should start thinking about wedding plans because she will soon become a bride. Again, that happens in the Czech Republic every year. Here's one that's close to home. If you've heard of Spain's running of the bulls, well, in Philadelphia, they have not the running of the bulls. They have the running of the Santas. This has been going on since 1998. Apparently, it started with like 40 guys who dressed up in Santa suits and they just went bar hopping. This quickly caught on. So a few folks decided to create an actual festival for everybody. And they used two main venues in the running of the Santas. There's a North Pole and a South Pole, all right? The South Pole is the New Lolly's Ale House, and that's where the party gets started, and they go crazy. They put up tents, and they have dancing and music and drinks and all that, and they spend some time partying there. And then the entire troop of Santas, which I think incorporates like hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of people dressed in Santa suits, they began their run toward the North Pole, which is another bar or restaurant called the Electric Factory. 
Now, if you want to participate this year, you are too late. It happened on the 12th of December. But if you want to uh, find out more about them or maybe even register for next year, you can do that. You can go to runningofthesantas.com. We're going to close the broadcast with the same legend that we opened the broadcast with. Of course, we're talking about the Christmas Krampus which is starting to take off here in the States after the movie's release. People are now talking about it. I've seen a few more videos shared about it. I didn't think the movie did a very good job at all of sort of explaining and fleshing out and enjoying the legend of the Krampus. But I can give you the basics here from my book, and I'll just read directly from Sacred Cows because I like the way I said it the first time. I said, allow me to introduce you to Santa's little helper from hell. And of course, we'd already gone through the Santa legend and other types of Christmas type stuff. It says this Christmas tradition in Austria, northern Italy and other parts of Europe has St. Nicholas visiting eager children with a dark companion in tow, a horned cloven hoofed demon called the Krampus. Forget threatening naughty kids with lumps of coal in their stockings. The Krampus will make them sorry they were ever born. The legend of the Krampus spans thousands of years. And also, like Santa's legend, has roots in ancient pagan symbolism and Germanic folklore. He's a nasty creature, tall and imposing, often covered in dark hair, and flicking the air with a large pointed tongue. He carries rusty chains, and he slings a large sack across his back, and I'll get back to those. If you're a fan of J.R.R. Tolkien, imagine the Krampus as a Christmas balrog. And if he ever pops down your chimney, you are guaranteed to have at least one less child to shop for next year. Vince DePorter, my illustrator, actually has some drawings of the Krampus wearing Christmassy clothes. Let's explore a scenario where a family's youngest son, let's call him Timmy, marks an entire year with spoiled, disobedient, and rebellious behavior, while his older siblings tow the line and earn their Christmas visit from St. Nick, Timmy does not. Well, apparently, Santa thinks that kids like Timmy need to be taught a lesson. But Santa doesn't like to do his own dirty work, so on December the 5th, that's the eve of St. Nicholas's Day, Santa rushes off for an evening of gifts, merriment, milk, and cookies with the good children, tasking his pet demon to serve up a naughty list recipe of pain and death for everyone who fell short of the mark. Little Timmy is in for a long night. According to legend, the Krampus will drop by Timmy's house with rusty chain in hand, and he will flog the child mercilessly. Once the boy has been soundly beaten... The demon will cram his still-living body into the sack and then, depending on region and tradition, do one of the following things. 1. Feast upon his flesh. 2. Toss him in the river to drown. 3. Drag him into the fiery pit of hell. It's pretty obvious why an American public weaned on a Charlie Brown Christmas isn't spinning this gruesome yarn around the hearth. Hey, Santa Claus is coming to town, kids, and his demon will fuck you up. But in places like Austria, Romania, Bavaria, Hungary, Croatia, and the Czech Republic, the Krampus is so adored that Krampusdag, or Krampus Day, is celebrated with huge and elaborate parades. By the way, if you get a chance, go to YouTube and just type in Krampus Parade. They're awesome. Hundreds of spectators wait in the streets for the ominous sound of rattling chains and rusty cowbells, announcing the arrival of the Krampus. Packs of costumed men adorned in animal fur, wooden masks, often very demonic, tall horns and glowing red eyes. As the crowd shouts in terror and delight, it's taunted and teased by Hell's minions. Females join in the taunting disguised as fire-breathing black angels. And there are even many demons played by children. It's a wild, happy, scary, surreal affair. Perfect for those who wish Halloween had an encore. And for the sensitive and squeamish, softer versions of the Krampus figure can be found. Just picture the offspring of a Valentine's Cupid and Hellboy, and you pretty much get the picture. Well, I was looking for a way to close the chapter of the book on the Krampus, 
And I was also looking for a way to kind of close the broadcast tonight. So I decided I'm going to go ahead and read my own riff on Clement Moore's classic Christmas poem, Twas the Night Before Christmas, except my version, of course, revolves around the Krampus. I'll just read this version. If you want the fully produced version with music and sound effects, it is part of the Sacred Cows audio book, and you can find that at audible.com and on iTunes. But I hope you enjoy this dark little shade of the legend of Santa Claus and Santa's little helper. Twas the night before Christmas, and all through the house ran a sniveling, back-talking, spoiled little louse. His parents were thwarted at every attempt and threw up their hands at his sneering contempt. But now he prepared for the gifts he would savor, despite a full year of substandard behavior. He watched near the hearth for the dangling of boots and Santa's big bag with a shit ton of loot. But much to his horror, he didn't see feet. The fireplace ignited with billows of heat. The room turned to crimson, the air turned to steam, and a demon emerged with a deafening scream. It grappled and dangled and rattled its chain, the scourge of St. Nick, an announcement of pain. Along with the stomping of hooves on the floor and glowing red eyes that were vile to the core. The Krampus had come with a present indeed, but one born of avarice, defiance, and greed. It bellowed with laughter, it teased, and it taunted, and as the boy begged, it continued undaunted, the striking, the whipping, the snap of the chain, until just a shell of the boy would remain. Then promptly it brandished a bag from its back and stuffed the child into the large empty sack to drag it and carry it into a well that emptied way down in the chasm of hell. With devils and demons and writhing in fire and Satan's throne perched high atop the red mire. Oh, how this young boy wished he'd lived his life better and followed instructions right down to the letter. If he could go back, he'd fix his mistakes and undo his crimes with whatever it takes. He'd listen and speak with respect and concern. He'd say please and thank you at every turn. He'd cook and he'd clean and he'd make up his bed, deferring and nodding and bowing his head. Alas, all his chances to change and revoke have gone in a plume of red ash, fire, and smoke. The Krampus came calling to do Santa's bidding. He'd told kids, be good, and he sure wasn't kidding. So listen, dear children, and don't you forget, that which you've given you surely will get. Will you get the carrot? Will you get the stick? Will you meet the Krampus? Will you meet St. Nick? Old Santa is watching, and you're on the clock. And youngsters across this great planet take stock. December will come, and your measure be taken. So act like a saint, or your ass will be bacon. Thank you so much for listening to the broadcast tonight. This will be the last show we do before the Christmas holiday. Going to take a few weeks with my family. I'll see you back here after that. So Merry Christmas to you and yours. Huge thanks to our show sponsor. It's Harry's.com. And don't forget, they've got those holiday shaving sets starting at 15 bucks. $5 off your first purchase with the promo code THINKINGATHEIST. And you get economy shipping until December 18th. So act fast and go to Harry's.com. H-A-R-R-Y-S dot com. Follow The Thinking Atheist on Facebook and Twitter. Watch dozens of original videos on The Thinking Atheist YouTube channel. And visit our website for resources, links, contact information, the editor's blog, and more. TheThinkingAtheist.com.